Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. I want to speak to you on this subject. The mark of compassion. The mark of compassion. Ezekiel speaks here in verse 1 of God and says, He cried in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Since the beginning of time, God has had to deal with sin in the lives of his people. Hardly had Adam and Eve begun to experience life until we find an angel is dispatched from the throne in heaven with a flaming sword in his hand to come to the earth and drive the fallen pair from paradise. Moses sinned against God by disobedience in the wilderness and struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And we find that Moses stands on the top of Mount Pisgah with tears streaming down his face, and God says, Moses, you'll never go into Canaan land. You can only take a look at it. And then God kissed him to sleep and took him home. Samson, that mighty hero of the Old Testament, tall and broad-shouldered, muscle-bound, hairy chest, big, strong Samson, the man upon whom God had put so much power, and yet we find him with his big shaggy head lying in the lap of a harlot. God must deal with Samson. The next thing you know, the Philistines have taken him, gouged out his eyes, and put him in the prison house and make him do the work of an animal. David, the man after God's own heart, walked one night on the roof of his house, looked over into his neighbor's backyard. There he looked at the neighbor's wife bathing herself, and lust was born in his heart. David took that woman committed adultery with her. She became with child. To cover up his sin, David murdered her husband. God had to deal with David. And the sword of judgment never left the house of David until the day that he died. God has had to severely deal with sin in the lives of his children down through the ages. When you take your Old Testament, you begin to study about the nation of Israel. And so often you read that the Bible says, Israel sinned in the sight of the Lord. Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Just such a case do we have here in the ninth chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel opens it up by telling how that God spoke to him about it. You know, usually God speaks with a still, small voice but not here. Because God's wrath is kindled. And Ezekiel says, He cried in mine ears with a loud voice. Because 
God was angry. God said, cause those that have charge over the city to come, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. Well, actually, in the original Hebrew, it isn't slaughter weapon, it's battle axe. And that's not your mother-in-law. That, <laughs> that's talking about a weapon, an axe with, with a double-edged head on it. And so that either way you'd swing that axe, it would do its job and be lethal. And so God said, cause those that have charge over the city to come, and each man with a destroying weapon, a, a battle axe in his hand. But I want you to notice in verse 2. Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which laughed toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. I believe these are not just mortal men. I believe these are angels. Notice where they came from. They came from the higher gate that lies toward the north. Where's God's throne? In the north. That's right. And these six men slaughter a whole city. I don't believe six mortal men could make it. But the Bible says that the angels excel in strength. So these are angels. Angels that God sends to do a job in the city of Jerusalem. Now notice that in verse 2 he mentions that there is one man among them who was clothed with linen with the writer's inkhorn by his side. And in the latter part of verse 3, And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. It's this mark that I want you to see tonight. We're told by the scholars that when Ezekiel penned this scripture, and he wrote those words, set a mark, that after the word mark, he put a parenthesis. And within that parenthesis, Ezekiel drew a picture of the mark that had been placed on the foreheads of those in Jerusalem that sighed and cried for the abominations that were done therein. Strangely enough, this mark was a letter from the old Hebrew alphabet. It was the very last letter in the old Hebrew alphabet, the Tau. Now, if you don't know what the Tau looked like, it was comparable, in fact, it looked almost exactly like our small letter T. I'm going to draw it for you on my forehead and let you see what it looks like. Now, you watch. You see, my finger comes down and then across. What does that look like to you? A cross. The old Hebrew towel was the same thing as a cross. And so the man with the writer's acorn was told to go through the city and put that mark on the foreheads of those that sighed and cried, those that shed tears with a broken heart for the sins in the city that were done against God. Then in the story we find that God sent the other angels through with the slaughter weapon, the battle axe in their hands. And they were to slaughter everybody, kill everybody who did not have this mark of compassion, the sign of the cross on their foreheads. Now, amongst the Hebrews of that day, the old letter Tau, when seen by itself, had a definite significance. It told them something. It gave them a message. It had a meaning when it was seen by itself. Let me show you what I mean. Today in algebra, if you see an X, that has signification, doesn't it? That X means the unknown quantity. That's what it tells you. If you're uh, taking a, a trip across the country and uh, you're looking for a motel 
And as you pull into this town and you see a string of motels, you come along and you see an oval sign up there that has three A's on it. This is a triple-A motel. Well, what that means is, that tells you, those three A's by themselves tell you that that motel is clean and there's no bed bugs. You see? Now, the same thing is true. You go to the supermarket. You go to the egg counter. You're going to buy some eggs. You pick up a package of eggs and it says, Grade A. You see that A by itself when it's stamped on the egg carton, and that means those eggs have been candled and there's not any little chickens in them. See? So one little letter by itself tells you a story. It, it gives you a significance. Now, to the Jews of old, that towel, when seen by itself, had a significance. It meant, thou shalt live. That was its meaning. Thou shalt live. And wasn't it so in this story? It was only those who had the mark who lived, and so it did mean that. Thou shalt live. Oh, but my friends, the cross has always meant thou shalt live. It's always meant that. Back yonder in Egypt, on the night of the Passover, when God came and He told the children of Israel, He said, Now you spread this throughout the land. I want you on this night to take a lamb and slay that lamb and go out in front of your house on the doorposts and the lintel and you take that blood and you put it on the lintel, that's straight overhead, and then put it on the doorposts. That would be on each side. And again, a perfect picture of the cross. God said, when I come through the land that night, Wherever I see that sign, I see that blood, I see that cross on the front of that house, thou shalt live. For when I see the blood, I will pass over you. But when there was no blood, when there was no cross, death would enter into that home. And so you see, the cross is always meant, thou shalt live. And it means it tonight. In this age in which you and I live, the cross still means, Thou shalt live. For when you come to the cross of Jesus Christ, and you call on Him, and you acknowledge to Him that you're a sinner, and that you realize you're on the road to hell and you deserve to be in hell, but you come to the cross and you apply the blood of Jesus by faith to the doorpost and the little of your own sinful heart, that cross one more time means thou shalt live. My friend, there's no other way to live eternally than through the cross of Jesus Christ. When God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, he wasn't kidding. God always means what He says and always says what He means. God said, only when I see that blood will I pass over you. And it was true in Egypt that night, and it's true now. God did not say, when I see your baptismal certificate, I will pass over you. God did not say, when I see your church membership certificate, I will pass over you. God did not say, when I see you take Holy Communion, I will pass over you. God did not say, when I see you take the catechism and, and on your day of confirmation you smile so religiously, I will pass over you. God did not say, when I see the good works you perform, I will pass over you. God did not say, when I see the money you put in the plate down at the church, I will pass over you. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And only when I see the blood. Dear friend tonight, if there's never been a time in your life when you called on Jesus Christ and asked Him to save your hell-bound soul, come into your heart and be your Savior, Master, King, and Lord, then the blood has never been applied to your heart. And your heart's still sinful and wicked and open in its sin before God. And God says, only when I see the blood will I pass over you. I plead with you tonight. If you've never received Christ, never applied the blood, you do it. You do it now before it's eternally. Too late. That sign of the cross was only placed upon the foreheads of those that sighed and those that cried for the abominations that were done in the city. 
And you'll notice he says in verse 6, Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man, or actually any person, upon whom is the mark. Thou shalt live, you see. And then he said, Begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. What a horrible scene it must have been. All over that city, on the streets and in the marketplaces and the courts, bodies piled heaps upon heaps, blood splattered on the walls, blood running six or seven inches deep down the gutters of the city. What a horrible, awful scene. What was the terrible sin? What was the horrible thing that was done in Jerusalem to cause this awful sin? The lack of sighing and crying for the abominations against God. All about us tonight are those who grieve the heart of God because they are on the road that leads to a burning hell. Multitudes of them don't even realize it. And yet they're marching to hell in step with time, moving toward eternity, lost and undone, and most of them don't even know it. Why don't they know it? Because you and I have failed in our job to get the message to them that Jesus saves. We have failed to have a broken heart over people who are headed for a burning hell and we sit around and let them go there and don't even shed a tear about it. And that is an abomination before God. The Bible says in the 29th chapter of Proverbs, in the 18th verse, where there is no vision, the people perish. And when God's born-again, blood-washed people have no real vision of what it means for lost souls to drop into an eternal hell, those people go on perishing. I wonder... What if God were to send His angels into this auditorium tonight? What if suddenly those doors on every one of those aisles opened up back there and men stepped through with battle axes in their hands? What if, starting over here in this section, a man with a rider's ink horn Begin to go from one person to the other while the, in, the men with the battle axes waited at the backs of the aisles. And then moved to this section and in and out this row and this row and this row and all the way back to you folks in the back. And then moved over into this section and started back there and what if he moved all the way across each aisle and came to each one of you? I wonder. And then this section and this one. I wonder. And then here in the choir all over this building, he moved from one individual to the other. And God knows your heart, friend. God knows your life. And God knows whether you're a soul winner or not. God knows whether you ever soak your pillow over lost souls or not. I wonder when the men with the rider's ink horn was through. And then they came with the slaughter weapons. And the blood began to flow down these aisles toward these altars. Would you be left? Or would your body be piled on the heap? How long has it been since you won one soul to Jesus Christ? How long has it been since you even tried? Did 
you ever notice here where they started? In verse 6, Then they began at the ancient men, which were, were before God's house. The older Christians, some of you here tonight have been saved 20 or 30 years. Have you ever won one soul to Jesus Christ? Have you ever tried? Have you ever shed tears and stayed awake and soaked your pillow in your bed sheets over lost loved ones and neighbors and friends that have gone to hell? Oh, listen to me tonight. We need a broken heart over sinners going to hell without hope. No chance apart from Jesus Christ. And there was a time, Christian, when you thought you were all right. Somebody got to you with the Word of God and showed you Jesus and you got saved. There's multitudes out there. And nobody's bothered to knock on their door. Oh, the cults will. The false religions will. But where are those door knockers who've got the true light in Jesus Christ to take to a sin-darkened world? We need a broken heart. We need to shed tears over lost souls. Yeah, I know a Old cold-hearted world will point its dignified finger at us if we do and say, Oh, those people cry in church. They're too emotional. I've had people come and visit this church. And when I'd go knock on their door and visit them in their home, they'd say, I'm never coming back to that church again. And I'd say, well, would you mind telling me why? They'd say, well, you're just too emotional over there. Why, you get up and you get all excited and you holler. And I saw people actually wiping tears from their eyes and blowing their noses. Well, poo 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 do. That same kind of a knothead will go home and turn on the television set and watch one of these stupid soap operas where Aunt George's Uncle Susie has a little boy, and his little boy grows up and he marries the girl, and the marriage doesn't work out, and their hearts are broken, they'll sit there <laughs> and cry over a stupid soap opera. And yet when somebody comes to God's house and weeps over people who are going to hell, he's too emotional. And that same knothead will go out to the football stadium, and now, don't misunderstand me, I love football. I, I played three years of it in high school. I've had this nose right here ground into the gridiron. I've put my share of blood into the football field. But when you look at football in the light of what we're talking about, it's nothing. And this same person who thinks we're too emotional, I shout and holler too much about trying to keep people out of hell, will go to the football game. And a bunch of goons will get out there and pick up a little piece of leather that somebody filled full of air and bat each other around. And one of the birds will get loose and start down the field. And this guy will stand up and say, Woohoo! Go, go, go! Yay! Go, 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 man! Team, team, team! And that guy will go over a little white line and he'll scream and he'll holler and he'll grab somebody, he'll cry, he'll hug somebody and get all excited. Big deal! And yet with somebody... Show some compassion and shed some tears and hollers and cries and, and shouts and spits and snorts a little bit to keep people out of hell. He's too emotional. God help us tonight. We need a broken heart. The Bible says that souls without Jesus Christ are L-O-S-T lost. Did you ever let that word lost grip your heart? A person who's never been born again, never been washed in the blood of the Lamb, is lost, lost, lost. And if we can't weep over a lost soul, 
Our heart is made of ice. We need to hit the altar and get right. My family and I, a few years ago, we were camping in the mountains down in southwestern Colorado. I remember one evening, the sun had just gone down behind the mountains. It began to grow dark, and we heard a family that had camped just a, a few yards from us were calling out a little girl's name. And pretty soon the word spread throughout the camping ground there that a little girl, I think she was four years old, had wandered out into the woods, and now it was dark, and she was lost. The people began to get their flashlights and their lanterns and join them to help. Nobody wanted to spare a thing to find a little girl who was lost. And time began to go on, and pretty soon those around the camp were weeping. They were shedding tears and they had never even known the little girl, but she was lost. There's nothing wrong with weeping over a little girl that's lost out in the woods amongst the wild animals. But by the same token, why are we thought to be such fanatics if we weep over lost souls out in the wilderness of sin, in the darkness of sin's stingy night, going to hell? Lost. Why shouldn't a Christian weep over lost souls? Many has been the time when the news has come from out on the sea somewhere that a ship went down in a storm and was lost at sea. And people will stand on the shore and on the docks and look longingly out toward the horizon of the sea and weep and cry because a ship was lost at sea. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should weep when people go to a watery grave in a storm on a ship at sea. But why is it thought to be so strange when people out on the sea of life are lost and are going to a black grave of outer darkness called hell. When we weep about that, they say we're strange. I remember during the Second World War, though I was very, very, very young, I do remember that oftentimes in our neighborhood there would come a yellow envelope with a black border all the way around it to somebody's mailbox. And with trembling fingers, they would open that black bordered envelope and it would say in there that a certain young man had been in a battle on a certain island and he was lost in action. Lost! The whole neighborhood would gather in that yard with that young widow or that mother whose son was lost in action and weep. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should. But when we hear that a person in the battle of life has gone into death without Jesus Christ and the lost, and we weep. People laugh and make fun. Oh, where are the tears? What's happened to God's people? Why are we afraid to care about people going to hell? Why shouldn't a Christian weep? over lost souls. David, in Psalm 126, told us, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And until you and I get a broken heart 
for people lost and going to hell. And until we shed tears for them, we are not going to be the soul winners that God wants us to be. And in the very next verse in that song, he says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Who is the person who shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him? The person that goes forth and weeps, whose heart is broken over sinners, lost, headed for the lake of fire, without hope. That's the person that shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. That's the person that will be the soul winner. Did you ever notice the order in which the weeping comes? It doesn't say he that weepeth and goeth forth. It says he that goeth forth and weepeth. The going comes before the weeping. And you can sit down and twiddle your thumbs and pray for the next 49 years. Oh, God, give me a burden for souls. And you'll never get it. But if you get up like God's told you to do and go out and start knocking on doors and talking to people on the job and wherever else your spirit of life finds you and you tell them of Jesus Christ, and you witness to them that there's a burning hell out there, pretty soon when you see them lost in their religion, lost in their education, lost in their so-called intelligence, lost in their pride, lost, it'll break your heart, and the tears will spill forth, and God will give you souls. How long has it been, Christian? since you want anybody to Christ. I don't care what your excuse is. If you've got a voice and a tongue and two legs, you haven't got an excuse. I've even known of deaf mutes to be soul winners. You and I have no excuse. None whatsoever. And you know, Christian, if we show compassion then the lost will show concern. But as long as you and I don't show any compassion, there seems to be no concern on our hearts for their souls. How do we expect them to be concerned? We need to be like our Savior. When we find Him in the ninth chapter of the book of Matthew, standing upon the hills over Jerusalem, looking down into the streets and the marketplaces with the tears running down his cheeks. And the Bible says, when he looked upon them, he saw them as sheep scattered abroad, having no shepherd. And then the Bible says, he was moved with compassion on them. He wept. He cried, he sobbed over the multitudes going to hell. His heart was broken for them. What about yours? Have you ever shed one tear over a lost soul? Some of you here have a lost daddy or a lost mother or both, and you've never even shed a tear over their soul. Never did keep you awake any part of any night. Where's the compassion? Some of you have a lost brother or sister, or cousins or aunts or uncles, kinfolks, loved ones, 
Going to hell. But when did you last ever weep and plead with God for their soul? And when did you last go to them? Do your dead level best praying for the power of the Spirit of God upon you to win that soul to Christ. Look in the mirror of God's Word tonight, Christian. Is the mark of compassion on your forehead? Or if God's angels came with the slaughter weapons following the man with the rider's ink horn, would your blood commingle with the blood of the others in this crowd tonight? We need to get concerned. We need to quit playing church in the United States of America. Because if we don't, this country is G-O-N-E gone. Where's the compassion? Where's the care? Where's the concern? Oh, how we need to get on our faces before God. And say, Lord, I've been so cold in my heart. And I've been so unconcerned about people going to hell. I've been so wrapped up in my life and my little world. But, Lord, I just haven't cared about the people around me and where they're going to spend eternity. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me of my wickedness and my cold, icy heart. And set me in flame tonight, Lord. That's what we need. Compassion. Concern. Over a lost world. Marching to the precipice of hell. There was a time when Napoleon was marching his army over the snow-covered mountains of Italy to conquer it. The weather was below zero. The army was zigzagging its way up across the mountains. Napoleon had given the command, Onward! If a soldier falls, leave him there. Go on. Go to the battle. Win the victory. And Napoleon's men were faithful, loyal men. They obeyed the orders of their commander-in-chief. Up in front of the long zigzaggy line crossing those mountains was a little drummer boy. It was this drummer boy's job to lead them. And while they marched, to beat the march on his little drum. One day, the little drummer boy, leading on as usual, stepped on some snow that hung out over a crevice that the wind had built there. And he fell hundreds of feet down into a canyon landed on a ledge. The ledge was snow-covered, so it broke his fall. He was hanging on to his drumsticks, and the drum was still around his neck. He waited. Certainly they'll drop a rope in a moment, but nothing. Those men faltered, stopped for a moment. Oh, how they wanted to drop a rope, and... Pull the little drummer boy out. It was sub-zero weather. He couldn't live down there very long. But Napoleon's words echoed in their minds. Forward! Onward! Don't stop for anything. They couldn't stop. And after a little while, they could hear back in the distance, echoing out of the canyon, the little drummer boy was beating 
the distress call on his drum. And over and over and over again he repeated the call of distress. But not a soldier could turn back. Then as they got higher on the mountain, the soldiers heard that stop and a different beat. This time, the little drummer boy was beating his own death march. When they told the story over and over around the campfires in the years to come, those rough, rugged, brutal, ribald soldiers Wept like babies. Remembering the little drummer boy that had to beat his own death march. Out yonder in this world tonight is a race of human beings who are beating their own death march. And when you close your eyes and think about it for a moment, you can hear the tramp of their feet. Tramp, 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 tramp. In the march toward hell. Where are your tears? Where is your broken heart? Christian. Do you have the mark of compassion? I'm going to ask that you stand, please. Where's that broken heart? I wonder, how long has it been, child of God, since you won a soul to Christ? And if you never have, how long are you going to wait? You don't know how long you have in this world. Oh, we need to come to this altar tonight and say, God, break my heart. Break it into little pieces for souls and make me a soldier. Get my mind off of the mundane things that aren't going to count. In eternity. And help me to make that life of mine count now. While I still have time to work. While the choir sings tonight. I'm going to ask you, Christian. Are you tired of that cold heart and that unconcern? You can't stop. But you can start now. In this altar I'll be lying tonight. With God's people who have said to themselves tonight, no preacher, in all honesty, I, I wouldn't be spared. My blood would mingle with the others. Because God knows I haven't been burdened and haven't wept and gone after souls like I should. You need to come, child of God. And then you, my dear lost friend tonight, you couldn't tell me how, when, and where you got saved. You know why? Because you're not saved. Don't lean on your church membership and your religion and your good works. You'll only go to hell leaning on those. You come tonight. You come and our counselors will meet you here. We'll take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. While the choir sings, come on, right now. I will serve you. I will serve you. Because I love you. How about your heart tonight, child of God?